So today I'm going to discuss quickly on the analytics of a uh, RNA LNP uh, for the for treatment of COVID, vaccination of COVID. I'm going to focus primarily on the RNA vaccine itself, with specifically interest on the SARNA field. So first of all, SARNA LNPs, you got to review them as not the same as a single SARNA molecule. Uh, they're a highly ordered structure that contains a combination of the lipid, the RNA, a bunch of excipients in there. And all, but all together, they result in a bunch of unique challenges. So first of all, you got to consider the product itself is not in solution. It's a suspension of tiny particles. These are prone to aggregation, precipitation, and you can also lose a lot of material when transferring from one vial to another. It's also important to keep that an idea that the excipient concentrations in there can cause a lot of impact on our RNA analysis, fluorescence interference, uh, as well as slight scattering complications during UV analysis. The physical characteristics of the particle cause other challenges. Uh, the idea being that a particle at, say, 50 nanometers will not behave necessarily the same as a particle that behaves at 200 nanometers. Uh, they have different light scattering characteristics, different uh, aggregation characteristics, and those need to be taken into account. The population will also contain a mixture of free and encapsulated RNA. Each of these species, I'll discuss in a, set, in a little bit, uh, have different impacts on the efficacy of your, of that, of your uh, drug product. And probably most paramount here is SARNA is a highly structured, very labile molecule that needs to be analyzed very carefully. So the LNP contains a number of different facets that are important for analysis. Uh, I'm going to focus again primarily, primarily on the RNA side of this, but on the LMP side, you got to consider we have a size, polydispersity, zeta potential, uh, composition of lipids, amount of lipids there. On the, and then on the R, RNA quality side, there's an encapsulation and also the payload design that are all faceted to give you the best potency possible. So before I go into deep into SARNA, it's important to describe where this molecule comes from and how we produce it. Because of its length and size, we cannot synthesize this molecule. Uh, basically, RNA synthesis is limited to about 30 to 40 uh, nucleotides. So anything larger than that is produced with a process called in vitro transcription. It proceeds where you have a DNA, uh, either a plasmid or linear DNA. You linearize it with the sequence you're looking for, and then you add a, a number of in, uh, enzymes in them that produce a mRNA transcript. This needs to be subsequently five prime capped using a different enzyme or different process, and a polyadenylation is also added to it. In the end, you end up with this highly ordered structure here that contains many different structural elements. It's also important to consider that each of these processes Enzymatic processes have different efficacies, so you can have very different yields day to day depending on how well they have worked. The complexity of, S of SARNA analysis is the labile nature of the SARNA molecule itself. And I've just highlighted here some important things to consider. So first of all, each of the nucleotides is connected through a phosphodiester bond. These are prone to hydrolytic cleavage especially given the presence of a two prime hydroxyl, which is a very good nucleophile to undergo autocatalytic cleavage. In the presence of oxygen, you can get oxidation reactions occurring. These oxidized species have lower uh, potency in vitro, uh, so it needs to be accounted for how long they've been exposed to oxygen. And in the case of, especially case of mRNA and sARNA, you, are, you link the five prime cap through a uh, five prime triphosphate moiety. These are even more labile than the phosphodiester bonds. And uh, you can lose five prime cap fairly easily without even noticing because it's such a small chemical change. But when you lose the cap, you lose complete potency. Now, there's a few ways to look at the integrity of the SARNA. The two major approaches are gel electrophoresis or capillary electrophoresis. So on the left here, it's just shown a uh, gel electrophoresis, an agros gel, of a sample of LNP that was kept at minus 80 degrees versus 4 degrees. And it was just run after seven days, 
And you can see that there's an intact species remaining at minus 80, but the one maintained at four degrees shows almost complete degradation. We can get a similar idea of integrity using uh, electrophore electrophoresis, capillary electrophoresis in the case here, in which we can see that there is a large intact species. In this case, this is a Cas9 mRNA. And this tailing to the front is, is, is actually all degraded species. You can also see that there's unique peaks in here. They are usually early termination events coming from the IBT reaction. Uh, we also need to monitor this throughout the entire formulation process. That's because shear forces, low pH, and uh, high temperatures that are sometimes used for formulation can be problematic for degradation. So you can have a perfect looking SARNA that goes into your formulation, but when it comes out in your final filter product, it's not there anymore. Uh, we also suggest that this is tested uh, fairly regularly through potency, as well as in vivo studies, uh, just, uh, just to ensure that the quality of material has been maintained. Another complicated area of analysis is the idea of five prime capping. So as I mentioned, after you produce the saRNA through IBT, it needs to be five prime capped. There's a number of different approaches here. But essentially here, we're looking for the addition of one nucleotide for an saRNA that can be 10,000 nucleotides or larger. So this is a, it basically excludes any capabilities like uh, capillary electrophoresis, gels. And the only way that this is can done is a targeted approach using a cleavage in the fi uh, five prime UTR by, uh, and looking by mass spec. So as an example here, if you take the sequence, we cleave at the five prime UTR and we run it by LCMS, we can get a combination of a capped and uncapped species. And this ratio between capped and uncapped species can actually have a huge impacts on the batch to batch potency of your saRNA. Another complicated fast, uh, concept is the idea of encapsulation. So you can imagine when you produce an LNP that there's this population of free saRNA out there and saRNA that's put inside. Now these two populations have very different uh, biological impacts. So when we have a encapsulated saRNA, it's not, it's fairly low immunogenicity, it's protected from nucleases, and it's also able to transfect at a very high efficiency. In contrast, the saRNA outside can cause immune responses, it will be degraded and it will not transfect. So the idea here is that your transfection, your concentration of encapsulated API is your actual concentration of uh, effective API. So if you have an encapsulation of efficiency of 0%, that means that you'll have, even though you have, may have a lot of siRNA in your formulation, you'll have no potency at all. So there's a couple of approaches we have to looking at the two different populations. The first of which is a separation-based approach. This uses a number of different techniques. Uh, asymmetric field fractionation, or FFF, has become one of the most uh, common here, but ultracentrifugation also is uh, being employed, in which we can separate chromatographically the free RNA and the RNA that's encapsulated inside the LMP. And we can use integration to compare the relative areas between the two. Another very common approach is a disruption approach using fluorescence assays, for example, the ribogreen in which we looked at the population uh, when the LNP is intact. So the ribogreen reagent can only interchelate in it with the free RNA. And then we disrupt the particle and we look at the total amount and the ratio between the two is an encapsulation efficiency. So the last slide here is the most important of all. This is the potency assay. Um, pretty much every LNP you develop must have a potency assay because of all these complex facets I've described. They all come together into the idea that if you are not seeing the correct potency by in an in vitro model, then your uh, formulation is not going to work in vivo. Uh, there are many different approaches here, FACs, ELISA's, Westerns that can be used, but it is we, we advocate over and over again to, to clients and to people we work with that this is an essential part of every analytical process and release criteria for LNPs.